Matthew chapter 15, begin reading at verse 21. And Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demonized. But he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and said, send her away, she cries after us. And Jesus said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of, of the house of Israel. He's testing her here. He's sent to the whole world and the Bible emphasizes that again and again. But he's prompting her faith to increase. And she came and worshiped him and said, Lord, help me. And he said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Let's pray. God, give me utterance today to speak your word under the anointing of your spirit, the spirit of power and love and soundness of mind. And give all of us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying today. We forbid any evil spirits to distract us or have anything to do with this service in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, we just surrender to you right now. Speak to us. We don't want to waste our time here just being religious and coming to assemble on Sunday morning. We want this to be time well spent where we worship you and we thank you for the mighty anointing that was on the worship today. And to hear your word. So God, grant us to hear your word and be changed. If I'm just up here putting on my little act, then I'll go home. But Lord, we believe you're speaking to us. So please do. And use this vessel to do so. Quicken me as you have thoughts that I didn't have and just let your will be done here today in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 Brother Harry and his family came from Milwaukee yesterday to um, the celebration of Ron Testa's life and he said he used to cast the devil out at the beginning of every service. He'd say, every evil spirit, get out of here in Jesus' name. And he noticed that a good percent of the, percentage of the congregation began to leave. They didn't know why. They just felt compelled. Because um, there's demonized people in this world. And some of them come to church and they come to church because they have needs. So I forbid the devil to mess with us, but I don't cast him out because I might lose a few people. <laughs> We're a little bit more mature audience than, than he has down there. A lot of street people, the ministry there has uh, kind of evolved into um, outreach to the homeless and such like. But uh, we still have issues too. And we need to get rid of them demons. Amen. Someday I'll preach on that. That's not the subject today. Neither is the Syrophoenician woman. I want to just look at one phrase in there. The children's bread. It is not good to take the children's bread and give it to others. 
Healing is the children's bread. That's what we're talking about here, being healed. And healing is the children's bread. God doesn't want, and we talked about healing last week, and I, I hope most of you were here for that. It was a pretty uh, well-rounded message on the subject of healing and the fact that God wants you healed. It's not an exceptional thing. Healing should not be the exception, but rather the norm among spirit-filled believers. And yet somehow, because of the unbelief that's drilled into us from public school and, and the whole world all around us, screaming for attention, we have to force our mind back to the world view of God. And healing is not an exceptional miracle. It's the children's bread. It's part of our diet. It's something that we should have on a regular basis. And when someone gets healed, by all means, give a testimony. But sometimes you only hear a testimony once in a great while because most people... They come forward for healing just in case it might work this time. But they're not really expecting much. And guess what? They normally don't get healed because we're healed by faith. This woman's child was healed because she had insistent faith. She would not take no for an answer. But like I said, a lot of us, especially with chronic pains and chronic issues, really don't have much faith for it anymore. But we pray anyway, and we sometimes come forward and have other people pray for us. I know sometimes people will say, oh, somebody will mention my shoulder or whatever, and they say, let me pray for you. And I'm saying, I wish you wouldn't. Half the world has prayed for me. I'm really tired of this. Because it does tend to wear you down. But God is still in the healing business, and he wants to heal you. And it should not be an extra extraordinary event among believers when someone gets healed. I believe I mentioned last week in regards to healing that too many charismatic and Pentecostal churches, Pentecostal is the old fashioned name for charismatic, which is kind of old now. I don't know what we call it anymore now, church. But anyway, that means you believe in the baptism and the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues, that you believe in healing and miracles and all of the gifts, the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. And there are those who don't believe in those things and those who are vehemently against them. There's preachers out there like John MacArthur and such that, preach, that, that call us devils, that say we're possessed with demons because... We believe in the Bible. They didn't see healings among themselves. They didn't see miracles. And so they said, the day of miracles must be past. The Bible never said that. The Bible said, when that which is perfect has come, when the resurrection of the saints is taking place and we have glorified bodies that don't get sick then there'll be no need for spiritual gifts because our whole existence will be a spiritual gift but I don't see that happening yet I haven't seen Jesus coming in the air 
I'm still in my same old body. It changes here and there over the years. People look at me now and say, you really lost a lot of weight. Are you kidding? I gained 15 pounds in the last couple of months. No, I was very sick, as Becky pointed out. I had uh, liver damage and veins bursting inside me. And, and uh, they didn't think I was going to make it. But I did. God had mercy. That, that seriously, they, you know, told Becky that it was really touch and go. Yesterday at Ron's funeral and celebration of his life, it was um, it was basically a service, a couple of songs at the beginning, and then a sermon. But uh, a lot of people came up afterwards and said, boy, I've been praying for you. I heard you were really sick and stuff, and yeah, but I'm healed, praise God. God had mercy on me and healed me. He's still in the healing business, even when the doctors say, probably not. Probably isn't gonna happen. I hope you have insurance. I don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> but it shouldn't be an extraordinary event when someone gets healed. We should be walking in, a, in the spirit and seeing healings and miracles and praying in tongues. And Our services should have manifestations of the spiritual gifts. Really, they're needed more outside the building because we're already believers. And the Bible says that, that healings and, and miracles and even speaking in tongues is uh, a, a sign to unbelievers. So we got to start praying for people outside the walls of the church. I worked a secular job, I still do, but uh, when I first, we first came back from India, I was delivering pizzas in Milwaukee, and I, we would come and, and I would sometimes deliver a pizza to somebody and they'd say, Pastor Kim, what are you delivering pizzas for? But uh, needed the money. And one day somebody at the restaurant there was sick and they asked me to pray for him because they knew I was a Christian. I prayed for him and they got healed. And people started listening to me after that. They started asking me questions about our church. A few of them showed up, but I don't, th I don't remember that any really got converted and joined us, but it, it got their attention. Up until then, oh, he's a Jesus freak. But after they see that there's something to being a Jesus freak, it's a sign to unbelievers that it's real. And they may not get saved right now, but you know down the line they're gonna because God planted a powerful seed in their heart that needs to grow a little bit, but it will. Healing is not to be occasional. Healing is not to be an extraordinary event. It's not to be an exceptional thing among us. It's to be the norm, the expected. Healing is the children's bread. It is what is rightfully ours. God's enemy, Satan, by the way, means adversary or enemy. And ours wants to steal the blessings of the Lord from us, including healing. John 10.10. 10. Well, most of you know it by heart anyway. 
The enemy comes but to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus comes that you might have life and you, you might have it abundantly. Hobbling around being sick is not abundantly. It rather shows that the enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying. We want to manifest the gift of Jesus, not the affliction of the devil. And it's provided for us, but it's obtained by faith. Luke chapter 13. I thought I had marked these verses, but I'm just like you, paging through looking for them. Luke chapter 13. My goodness, all these notes, it takes forever to get through the book of Luke. Beginning at verse 11. There was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, a demon making her sick. 18 years, and she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. That's a, not a common occurrence here, but we saw it in India, where people are just hunched over and can't get up. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Infirmity just means you're not well. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But of course they got mad at him because he did it on the Sabbath. But he wants us to be healed. He wants us to be healed. He, ought not this woman who is bound by Satan be loosed? Satan wants to steal from us. God wants to give us our health back. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. Acts 10:38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. God is with us too. And that's why Jesus paid the price, Jesus rose again, sent us the Holy Spirit so that we can go about healing all who were oppressed of the devil too. God anointed you and I with the Holy Spirit and with power so we can go about doing good and healing all those who are oppressed of the devil. For God is with us. Praise God. Is God with you? Now that's another sermon, but really, we ought to practice the presence of the Lord. We ought to remind ourselves that we're not just going to work and doing this and doing that and surfing on the, our tablets and whatever. The things that people do nowadays. I don't have time for that stuff. I'm sorry. I, I don't spend a lot of time on the computer unless I'm working on something. Definitely don't spend any time on the internet. I just, you know. And I realize there's some good things there too, don't, don't get me wrong. But uh, God's got me busy doing stuff. Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. First John chapter three, verse eight. 
He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Then he gets to the part of the verse that I want to look at. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Sickness is a work of the devil. That woman was bound by the devil those 18 years. Jesus went about healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And John says that's what he came to do. For this purpose, he came. God was manifested among us through Jesus Christ that he might destroy the works of the devil. Healing defeats the works of the devil. Because that's one of his greatest afflictions upon us. Sin, sickness, Excuse me. Jesus more or less had to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, because their very presence was an affront to everything that he had to say to mankind and wanted to do among us. He came to destroy the works of the devil. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. He had to heal the sick and so do we. Sickness is a form of rebellion against God. Not that we're rebelling when we get sick, but the devil is rebelling by making us sick. And Jesus declared his stance on sickness every time he healed somebody. I'm against it. I'm against it. Healing is also a sign of the truth of the gospel, like I said. These miracles happen as a, as a sign to the unbelievers. Mark chapter 16, these signs will follow those who believe. By the way, from about Mark chapter 16, verse 17, all the way to the end of the chapter, you may have a Bible that has a little footnote there and says, this is not found in some of the old manuscripts. Or some Bibles you even have to Read the footnote to see what it says. Who do you suppose is behind something like that? Some of the most powerful promises in the Bible, and because a couple of old manuscripts, for whatever reason, didn't include it, it's in the oldest. Anyway, let me read it to you. These signs will follow, Mark 16, 17. Those who believe. Do you believe? How many believers do we have here? One, two, three, four, five. St. Paul Believers Fellowship. When we started, we called our church New Wine and people said, what's that? A program to get off the sauce or something? So we changed the name. We're believers and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. These are things we should be doing as a matter of lifestyle may not cast out a demon every day. Although if you sense yourself being oppressed 
or having doubts and fears that you normally don't entertain, or maybe you do entertain them but don't have to, tell the devil to get lost. Take your fear and get out of here in the name of Jesus Christ. These signs shall follow them. They shall cast out demons. They shall not surrender to them. They shall not allow them to exist and coexist. They will speak with new tongues. If you speak in tongues, and you should, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you're not, you need to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the Bible declares, and we preached on this about two weeks ago, that tongues is the first sign of someone being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So use it. Speak with tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. We don't run into too many poisonous snakes in Minnesota. There's one poisonous snake in Minnesota, and it's found down in the southeast corner, up in the woods. It's timber rattler. And it's not very common, and it's not as poisonous as some of the diamondbacks and the larger rattlers in the southwest. But we're not likely to run across too many poisonous snakes. If we drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt us. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We're supposed to not have these things amongst us. And in verse 20 of Mark 16, it says, and they did it. And they went forth and they preached the gospel in all the world, the Lord working with them and confirming through the signs and wonders they did. Like I said, that's what impressed the people at the pizza place. Somebody got healed. It's a confirming sign. Every one of them believes in the gospel now. They may not have committed themselves at that time, but every one of them was convinced that God is real because someone who was really sick got really healed. It wasn't like, oh, I feel a little bit better, kinda. It was a healing. So healing is a confirmation of what we're saying, an attesting sign of the truth of what we preach. Healing outdoes the works of other religions. T.L. Osborne used to start his meetings in Asia. And I, I remember an incident, which was, I believe, in Malaysia, where he had a, a large meeting and it was populated by Hindus and Muslims. Muslim, Islam is basically the, the religion of a lot of that, the Indonesia and everything. And there's a lot of Hindus in Thailand and Malaysia too because of Indian people that have gone there. Anyway, and he said, who's the sickest person up here? And they wheeled somebody up on a little, uh, what do they call the little come-alongs we have to crawl under a car? That's, that's a wheelchair in Asia. It's enough to break your heart. You know, you just people pushing themselves along by their arms or somebody pushing them on these little four-wheel dollies. Anyway, they brought somebody on one of those little flats up to him and they said, this sickest person we can find right now and he had all the Hindu priests and Muslim uh, imams and stuff come up and he said, pray for them. Well, they were on the spot, they had to. And nothing happened. Then Osborne said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he took his hand and lifted him up and he walked. People listened to him after that. They doubted their own religion after that. 
It's a, a, a testing sign. It demonstrates God's goodness. It demonstrates he's more powerful than the pagan gods. There probably are pagan gods, but we call them demons, fallen angels that love to get people to worship them instead of the true God. Healing advertises the work of God. We don't need to buy airtime. We don't have to have expensive advertisements. All we need to do is heal the sick and people will come. If people knew they'd come to this church and get healed, we'd have standing room only. I've shared many times some of our own meetings in India and elsewhere where we started healing the sick and the people ran home and got, their, got other sick people to bring. Hey, it's working. Go get grandma. Healing defeats the works of the enemy. Healing is a confirmation of what we preach. And I like my three-point sermons, you know. And healing, number three, is God just showing compassion on people. God loves us. He doesn't want us to be sick. Every time I wince in pain, the Holy Spirit winces too. Matthew 14, 14, when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. God looks at the woes in this world's world and heals them. Somebody said, well, what about something like Ron Tester? He died. You know, the same thing, ha I, I had a chance to talk to his wife at length. Because we, we go way back, Ron and Debbie and Becky and I. And uh, she said the same thing happened eight years ago. He fell asleep didn't actually become comatose, but didn't wake up either. You know? I don't know what the difference is. But he finally came out of it and ministered for another eight years. And so this time the same thing happened and he didn't get healed. And she said, God gave him an extra eight years. That was her attitude towards it. God gave him an extra eight years. Ron's dad died when he was 58. I remember that because my dad died when he was 58. And we used to, in fact, just this spring, we joked about it on the telephone. He had, he had come up to Atlanta, was staying with his son. And uh, we were talking, yeah, but we outlived our dads by about 15 years here, just about, you know. 10, 12 years, whatever it is. And because uh, both of us are 71. Pastor over there in North St. Paul, Denny McGrain, he's 71 too, and we're all healthy. Well, Ron died, but anyway, Debbie was, his wife was just blessed that she got another eight years, and she says, I know it's God's timing because he, he could have gone eight years ago, but God gave him another eight years. And, and, and she just had a really healthy attitude about it. She, no doubt, she goes home and cries and everything too. But at the same time, she sees the hand of God. God has compassion on us. That's why he heals. Jesus was moved for, with compassion for them and healed their sick. That's why the Bible, you know, why does God heal? Well, there you go. The Bible says it's an attesting sign. It confirms the word we preach and, 
and it's an expression of God's compassion on us. God does care. People always question us. If God is a loving God, how come there's so much evil in the world and how come there's so much sickness and disease? That's not of God. Those are the works of the thief. Those are the works of Satan, the enemy, the devil. And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Don't blame God for what the devil does. How dare you? How's that for an answer to the next person that asks you that? How dare you question God about his compassion? when he's gone out of his way by sending Jesus and then giving us the Holy Spirit to do the same works as Jesus did, only to have half the preachers in the United States say, well, that all died in the first century. We don't do that anymore. And people who do speak in tongues and stuff, they probably got demons. Forget you, Jack or John or all you other evangelicals. I don't listen to them. I, I don't have time to listen to sermons unless I go to another church or something anyway. But uh, if I was gonna listen to a sermon, I wouldn't listen to an evangelical because when they deny something as big as the power of the Holy Spirit, How can they have the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Really? To me, it kind of reduces the whole thing to an intellectual exercise. And they might have a lot of good intellectual insights. And I, I, maybe I'm a little bit prejudiced on this one because I'm tired of being called a devil because I believe the Bible. Anyway, Jesus still has compassion God didn't quit having compassion after the death of the last apostle. Church history shows that God never has stopped healing the sick. St. Patrick healed the sick. And his disciples, the, the church had become overrun by the German tribes and such, and... Uh, I'm German and Irish, so I got a, a ticket on each side of this argument. But, uh, and they, they brought their pagan religions and overran the Roman Empire, which was at least Christianized up until that point. Well, Patrick, out in Ireland, they, they, the uh, Germanic tribes and the Huns and stuff never made it that far. And so they had a revival out over there, and they sent missionaries to continental Europe who re-evangelized Europe. And they believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, and they healed the sick and turned Europe around again, praise God. We can do that stuff. We don't have to roll over and play dead because pagans are taking over our government and, and everything else in this land. We can start being Christians and start showing the power and the people will listen to us. And if enough people listen to Jesus, we'll be electing godly people instead of ungodly people. We have seen record-breaking godlessness in Washington in the last couple of years. Unbelievable. Not even lip service to God. It's really sad, but we can change that. And God's given us the power. And he has compassion on the United States. He has consistently sent revivals because this country was founded on Christians, by Christians looking for religious freedom. And God honors that and has continued to send revivals. Every generation has its own revival. I was saved in the, numerically the largest revival the world has ever seen. 
the Jesus movement and the charismatic uh, renewal of the 60s and 70s was brought it more people into the things of the Spirit than any other move in history. And there was little revivals here and there since then. We're ready for another one if the church would get on the ball and start doing it. Some of us, most of us, are more mature and we can avoid a lot of the foolish mistakes and the excesses that sometimes take away from our message. But we gotta open our mouths and we gotta believe the gospel and lay hands on the sick and see them recover and do the stuff, as John Wimber used to say. Let's do the stuff. When do we get to do the stuff? Let's go out and do the stuff. God does care, and he's done something about suffering and injustice in the world as we know it. He sent Jesus, and he gave us the power to continue the work of Jesus. That's his larger cause, but his more immediate cause is he has compassion on you, on everybody who the devil has stolen their health in one way or another. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand today. Hope you got something out of that. Grant that your word would just really take root in us and change our hearts and lives. And we already believe these things, most of us. But we need to have them so deep in our hearts that we unconsciously live them and believe for healings and take authority over the enemy and every area that he has afflicted us and the people around us and the people that we can help. Have compassion on this city. Have compassion on our loved ones. And stretch forth your hand to heal and do mighty works. <clears throat> 